Good afternoon, all. Welcome to this session on uh, exascale computing architectures, including quantum computing and hybrid HPC quantum. Um, so, I mean, we are just installing the pre-exascale systems, but already we're, we're starting to talking about uh, exascale and start, starting to think forward what is, uh, is coming uh, in the next years. I mean, the discussion for exascale has started, I think, 10 years ago, the moment we, we installed the first petascale system already, the world was uh, starting to, to think what are the challenges ahead uh, and what, what the, the gaps need to be fulfilled technologically from the data center point of view, from the computation point of view. Now we are reaching there, we are almost there, I think, the first exascale systems should be coming this summer, if all goes well. well if we also uh, believe the, uh, the, 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 the news and the publications, some of exascale systems are already there. So it's not uh, uh, such a far-fetched now technology. It is really uh, just around the corner. However, now we also have the uh, additional challenge of uh, quantum computing, uh, which only I think now we're trying to, to, to grasp and to understand how exactly it's going to be used for our actual applications and also what are the implications for uh, procuring, installing, operating quantum systems, how we can combine quantum systems with traditional digital systems. So these are essentially the, 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 the subjects we're going to cover within this session. We have organized a, a very nice uh, panel uh, with uh, colleagues and experts from uh, our pre scale data centers, but also from uh, quantum computing. Uh, unfortunately, we, we have one miss. We had one additional participant, Mr. Richard Vers-Lewis, Vers who was going to, to contribute in the aspects of quantum computing, but uh, unfortunately he got COVID a few days before the meeting and he could not join us. However, I think the rest of the panelists will be able to cover all the subject. So, um, how would this organize? We, we will have three PowerPoint presentations from uh, our three panelists and one presentation uh, without PowerPoint. And then we're going to have uh, a panel discussion with questions and then also at the end interaction uh, with you. So I will start immediately with our first speaker. It's, Mr. it's Dr. Frederick Robertson, uh, who is a technology strategist at CSC, IIT Center for Science, and will present uh, the work of CSC and Lumi. So Frederick, please. Oh. Hi, uh, I'm Frederick Robertson from CSC, filling in for Pekka Manninen, who could not make it. Uh, the idea here is to talk a bit about uh, Lumi, what we currently have, our exascale and post-exascale like visions for what could be happening. Uh, so, uh, briefly touching on the current situation of the system. So, Lumi C is in operation. You all heard this. There was interesting presentations about it yesterday. Lumi G, the GPU partition, is arriving. The first cabinets have landed in Europe. I don't know ex their exact whereabouts right now. But there we're looking at 2,560 nodes with four GPUs in them, where the committed performance is 375 petaflops for HPL. In that sense, if you're looking forward towards exascale, one could make the argument that Lumi is an exascale architecture. It is, in the end, the same architecture that Frontier at Oak Ridge uses. So one could fairly easily achieve an exaflop in HPL by just throwing money at the problem. So three times more GPUs, three times more power consumptions, you'd be looking at a 30 megawatt system. And the question then is if we want to scale, we'd want to scale up that fast and if 30 megawatts for an exaflop is sane. But talking on the power consumption brings me on to the site where we're hosting it. So it's hosted in an old paper mill in Kajani, Finland. So in the hall where the paper machine used to be before they shipped that one abroad. The site itself, the paper mill is very power intensive. So on the site, there's 200 megawatts of 
power available. All of that is hydroelectric power, so zero CO2 emissions. Of that, Lumi uses less than 10 megawatts. The, it's fairly far north, so you can get away with free cooling most of the year. It's about two degrees Celsius the mean temperature year round. With the power available, we can host far larger machines than Lumi. There's also space. There's a lot of space. Uh, if you can bring in a machine and just lay it down on a concrete slab, you can probably start working quite, quite quickly. But if, if you value your support personnel's uh, comfort, you might want to construct a box within that great hall. A bit like if you've seen the picture of Servlumi, it's a box within the hall. But in that sense, uh, looking forward to the future. So uh, it's a bit funny to talk about our future plans since we're just installing the system. Uh, that is that Lumi is a five year project. So while there have been discussions for, let's make a Lumi 2 when this project is successful, there aren't really any concrete plans for what hardware it would be. Time frame wise, it's 2026 onwards, definitely what would be categorized as a post exascale machine. In that time frame, you're looking at a machine that would be far more heterogeneous. Uh, we've seen with smartphones, with uh, other hardware where we're getting application specific accelerators built in for everything. In that time frame, we're probably gonna see more, more of those being used in HPC. So you get into a situation where you actually have multiple different partitions for specific tasks. And there also you get into a situation where you're gonna have multiple strong partitions. We're currently focusing a lot on GPU compute. It's not feasible to completely change the paradigm for the next machine. So we'll need some form of GPU partition there. But at the same time, whatever the API comes out with accelerator wise, that would probably be another interesting partition. And well, the machine learning field is maturing in the sense that the accelerators available might actually be relevant and interesting. Uh, in an ideal world, such a tender would be carried out on the basis of science throughput, but uh, all the vendors sort of shudder when you say science throughput, so it's not really something you can put into a tender. But at the very least, we should settle for looking at application throughput instead of some listing, top 500 listing or similar. However, we're probably gonna be looking at far more integrated hardware. We're already seeing that happen today. So in five years time, that's probably gonna be even more. An interesting thing to look about, also interesting thing to look about would be some form of composable hardware where you'd have pool of hardware that you can just combine into what nodes you want. Oh, you want this much memory, this much storage and so on. And with this type of heterogeneous systems, you're gonna have workflows that span multiple partitions and that's gonna be an interesting work for the workflow managers that you need to figure out where to run certain parts of your workflow. And then no uh, exascale or post exascale machine would be complete without talking a bit about quantum. So in that sense, we're already, we're already working on that. Uh, we have a large consortium of partners that are involved in Lumi. And within that, we already have a few quantum machines up and running. We have two projects currently where we're looking to integrate some form of quantum compute, computing into Lumi. These are not by any means big machines, but uh, definitely real quantum computers. In this case, it would be more of a distributed approach where they're not co-located in the data center. One of them is, I think it was in Sweden, and another one is in Helsinki. So as such, there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interesting things ahead. The hardware landscape is gonna evolve drastically. Quantum computing is coming. So as such, it will be interesting to see what the next systems will look like. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. And our next speaker is Dr. Gabriela Stuccione who is leading the HPC Data Management and Analytics Division of the HPC Department of Cineca. Gabriela. Uh, 
Okay, um, so Leonardo is one of the triple exascale system that uh, uh, are funded by EURSPC and also in this case by the Italian Ministry um, of the University and Research. And so it's, um, let's say, Leonardo is a, a system that is based on Atos Bursequana uh, technology and uh, um, it contains over 13,000 uh, uh, GPUs based on NVIDIA Ampere uh, architecture. And um, let's say the, the, com the computing power that we foresee is around 250 petaflops with an, an, um, an archive, a storage of 120 uh, petabytes. Um, uh, the technology uh, that we use to cooling the system is 95% uh, direct liquid cooling with uh, warm water technology. And uh, NVIDIA Mellanox uh, interconnect of 200 gigabit per second uh, will be used. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's uh, go more in deep to the, to the architecture. Leonardo has a modular computing architecture mainly based on two uh, modules. Uh, the booster module that has uh, the, mm, the aim uh, to satisfy the most computing uh, power demanding uh, um, application in terms of uh, um, time to solution. And uh, it, uh, it will have uh, around uh, 3,500 uh, nodes uh, based on four each node is based on four NVIDIA um, Ampere GPUs and one uh, Intel Ice Lake GPU. Um, on the other hand, the data-centric or also general purpose module has the aim to accomplish almost all the a wide range of applications, also so those applications that uh, cannot base, cannot, have not be ported on GPUs. And this is composed of uh, something around 1,700 nodes, uh, com each node composed of two Intel um, Sapphire Rapid uh, GPUs. Um, there is uh, also um, um, another partition, the third partition that is uh, composed by 60 nodes and this was conceived for visualization, and particularly the visualization. Uh, all these modules are connected to the storage that has uh, uh, two tier, a fast tier and uh, a high capacity tier. Okay, um, almost uh, all the application uh, will run on Leonardo. And uh, you see here a presentation of the application uh, the, the main one, at least, that we try to, scale, to, to categorize per domains. So in particular, the, um, the slide of uh, cake that are most uh, evident, in, part in particular material science, uh, earth science, uh, weather and climate, uh, um, and uh, also life science, are um, the domains on which, uh, let's say, Chineca uh, has a, a bigger uh, community, scientific community, on which we have more projects, let's say. Uh, this is a representation of Leonardo. Leonardo will be um, uh, ready at the end of the year. In particular, the, uh, Leonardo will be uh, ranked in uh, November and uh, immediately after will be released uh, in, pro in production for the users. Um, where? Where uh, Leonardo will be located? Um, I guess that almost uh, all of us, when uh, um, HPC Center wished to um, host a, a new uh, a pre scale or extra scale computers to, re to revisit, to, to change uh, its uh, data center, to, to adapt to the need of the supercomputer. In particular, we foresee since the, since the beginning uh, to host uh, um, Leonardo in a new data center, so not in the Mm, Chineca uh, present one, that uh, is uh, um, part of a, a bigger project that we call Tecnopolo di Bologna. And um, it's, a, uh, it's a project uh, uh, that was uh, mm, uh, mm, pursued by, in particular, the Emilia uh, Romagna region and by the Ministry, Italian Ministry of University of Research to create a sort of scientific park where mainly uh, uh, for the end of the year, there will be three 
main uh, um, HPC data center. One already there, that is ECNWF, uh, that relocated uh, its data center in Bologna, in the Technopolo. And uh, you see in the picture, the four botti um, uh, are uh, for, uh, for them. The two orange one will be uh, for uh, Leonardo and also for NFN, that is uh, the National Institution of Nuclear Physics. Um, the, we will, um, in the first phase, the Technopolo uh, will have a 10 megawatt and uh, we will use that, uh, that, uh, uh, that capacity and then in the second phase we will increase. Uh, we will increase. So um, the, the area was, uh, is an historical building that uh, uh, was designed by Luigi Nervi in the 50s for an old um, tobacco manufacturing. So it is particularly challenging here to uh, the refurbishing of this building that is protected by cultural heritage uh, for this new, uh, for this new uh, scope, let's say. Uh, in the end, uh, the vision of Chineca for uh, exascale, for exascale, and quantum is in some way represented synthetically here. Um, uh, so there is the past, the four, uh, let's say, circle on the, on the left. Leonardo is the green, so is the present. And what we imagine is that at the end of uh, Leonardo phase around 2026, we, um, we will uh, have uh, a one exascale system uh, on which we are also uh, mm, uh, searching funds also at national level, of course. And in the middle, one of the aim that we have is to um, give to our scientific researchers the possibility to use quantum resources. Uh, we started this year, 2021-2022, with uh, uh, giving uh, quantum as a service uh, uh, possibility to them. We had uh, we create um, we uh, had some agreement, uh, some contract with the Wave, uh, Alpine um, uh, Technology, and Quantum Technology, and uh, Pascal, and these uh, so some resources that they, the, the researcher can use can play with it. But in the future, we will also to integrate the quantum uh, computing in the HPC, in particular, in Leonardo. I, I finished, I just wish to, uh, I'm sorry I have uh, in, um, at three o'clock have to leave, so probably I won't be here for the discussion. So I have my colleague uh, Daniele to take the most difficult part <laughs> for, for him. So. Thank you, Gabriella. So we're moving now to our third pre scale hosting entity, Barcelona Supercomputer Center. And uh, we have Dr. Sergi Cirona, who is the Director of Operations for the Department of Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and also Manager of the Spanish Supercomputing Network. Sergi, please. Thank you very much, Vangelis. Thank you for inviting me for the opportunity to share this, the, the view of Barcelona on, on hosting a, a pre scale and, and the path to, to exascale. So I appreciate this opportunity. So uh, is the big one green, huh? The big one now. Okay, I'm presenting you the status of the call. We presented for being a hosting entity in 2019, maybe. And, and that was the figures that we were presenting. So we, we, our proposal was including not only the, the implementation of a system for, for production, for providing service to users, but also the development of an experimental platform. Because we believe that we need to develop the technology from the basement from the very beginning. It's not only uh, purchasing systems, but we have to develop them and we have to enable this technology. So th this is a total cooperation between the EURHPC, which is joining the European Commission, uh, the Spanish government, the Portuguese government, Turkey and Croatia, for developing this overall project on 270 million euros. So and you see uh, there is a footnote indicating the spec of the systems. So the spec of the systems on the initial call was, or it was uh, on 200 petafops peak, and now we're expecting at least 205 sustain under limpack aggregated performance. So, of course, I cannot tell you what is going to be the system because the system is under procurement. So it's under devaluation, I can say that. Yeah. 
flip. Uh, so it will come a result someday this year, no? soon. Okay, I, I can say soon, soon. Uh, but that's the, our concept. So in this slide, it's very complex and very complete. So I will be happy to answer any point of time of this slide. But in, in, in this slide, we are included on some parts, archive, storage. We are fetching for having a high performance disk of 200 petaflop, oh, 100 petabytes. At the same time, we wanted to offer long term storage because we can hear the communities that they need these capacities when we are looking at least for 400 petabytes. On the, on the middle part, we are, we are presenting the size of the systems. But maybe this is not on the size of the performance, but on possibly on the cost, because we are very interested to have a very large partition, at least 35 sustain on the LIMPAC for general purpose processors, and then at least 150 sustain under HPL for accelerators. But at the same time, we want to have, as well, a couple of systems of new technologies, because we are sure that we have to prepare our users, our environments, for the next future, for the exascale systems. So we want to try these technologies and make it available. We, on the left, you can see easily that we are also mentioning cloud services. Okay, HPC. You need to get access through some environment. So it's all included in this slide. Okay, so I'm sure that we are setting up a system that is very good for users and for any, any, any kind of, of environment. The facility, the facility is ready and waiting for the system. So you see here some pictures last week we took. So from the cooling, from the, we have a laser pointer here, for the compute room, for the electricity, for the water supply. I, I, I can insist but all the centers of the Pexiscale systems are home water, warm water cooling. So we're expecting a PUE which is below 1.08. We're defining a, a maximum power consumption of 12 megavolt ampere. Why that? Okay, because the system is using general purpose and then it's using more energy than a, an accelerated system. And, and we will be fitting everything in 900 square meters. So you see, everything is ready for hosting system now. Which applications we are facing to? Any. But, of course, we do believe that digital twins are necessary. So you can recognize easily combustion. It's a problem of, of the citizenship. We need to have energy. We need to have access to this energy that's becoming expensive any day we are going. So we need to be able to understand these concepts. Personalized medicine. It's a hard topic also for BSC. So we want to have our digital twin to make sure that any drug is tested on different persons, any different individuals at any point of time. On bottom, destination Earth. Digital twin of Earth, because we wanted to have some place to live in, adequate environments. So those are different things. And of course, we are dealing with the competent centers. We want to have cooperations with industry. We want to do the tr knowledge transfer to the, to, the, to the different companies. And this is obtained via the competent centers. And at the bottom, you have the centers of excellence. Centers of excellence, BSC. Well, BSC is 800 people. We are managing to be involved in many of them, but we strongly believe that this is a good way to go to support the different applications and different domains. And my la last slide, of course, it's not that my imagination went over, but we had just the presentation by my friend and colleague, uh, John Davis, and I, I took his slide, because this is the way we believe. We have a single objective. We believe that we need to build a system instead of buying. And this is the way we consider. So going to a flagship initiative that we can work with the vendors on what is the system we are dealing and we are manufacturing and we are building. So we are ready for this and what we need to find is the way how we're implementing this in, in Barcelona. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sir. So uh, now we will switch to the quantum computing subject. And uh, we have together with us Professor Dr. Christel Mikkelsen, who is a group leader of the Quantum Infor Information Processing Group at the ULIC Supercomputing Center and Professor of Quantum Information Processing at RWTH Aachen University. She will have a talk on uh, quantum computing. Christel. Thank you very much. 
I will uh, introduce to you the Euro-HPC Joint Undertaking Project, HPC-QS, which stands for High Performance Computer and Quantum Simulator Hybrid. But before I do this, I want to give you some introduction on quantum computing and a little bit on history. As you all undoubtedly have noticed, quantum computing enjoys great attention and this at the highest level of research and economic policy. This on national, European and international levels. It also promises unprecedented potential for important computing tasks such as simulations in chemistry or material science, optimization and machine learning. Now it's with this potential that quantum computing is increasingly attracting interest from industry and scientific groups that use high performance computing for their applications. These pilot users are primarily interested in testing whether these available quantum computers are in, or the ones that we have nowadays or in the foreseeable future, that they are suitable for simulating increasing complex systems, analyzing large data sets using machine learning methods or performing the hardest optimization task. What are potential applications of quantum computing? One can think about materials design for batteries, but also drug design, portfolio optimization in finances, risk mitigation in um, insurance, flight and train scheduling, hotel reservation, power trading and scheduling, image-based medical diagnostic, and many more. So quantum computing, you can imagine that this can considerably change science, industry, economy, and also our everyday life. Not immediately, but possibly in the future. The reason is not immediately, that's because quantum computing is still lags behind classical computing for most practical applications. Its completely novel computational approach is based on tensor products of states, but this could revolutionize scientific computing and enable discoveries across a diverse range of fields beyond the reach of classical methods. Now, the research in applications of quantum computing to real-world problems is still in its infancy. And therefore, the early entry into the practical application of quantum computing, or practical quantum computing for short, is of utmost urgency in order to evaluate quantum computing as a new compute technology. Now, the prerequisite for this early access to quantum computers at the forefront of development, taking into account the different technical approaches, is this first prerequisite. Another one for the practical quantum computing is the integration of quantum computers into existing HPC infrastructures. And this in order to enable the execution of quantum classical hybrid computing models on these integrated HPC quantum computing infrastructures. What are arguments for these hybrid quantum classical computations? A first one is that today, most applications in quantum computing are re realized algorithmically with a high degree of hybridicity. In hybrid computations, classical algorithms are combined with quantum algorithms. So for example, one has quantum optimizers for machine learning, or one has the variational quantum algorithms. But there is also another argument, and this arises from the side of high performance computing. So when we consider the energy consumption of our big HPC machines, then these uh, state-of-the-art supercomputers are using so much electrical power that one can save energy 
through the exploitation of quantum computers, even if these quantum computers only perform a small task, then we still have a benefit in energy consumption. Now, these quantum computer systems can be used as standalone uh, machines for experimental and development purposes, and or they can be deeply integrated as accelerators of our classical uh, computing devices. So we will use them as quantum processing units, as accelerators for what we already have. In Jülich, we have established the Jülich Unified Infrastructure for Quantum Computing. And this is a manufacturer agnostic and independent quantum computer user facility, which needs or which meets all these needs. The aim of UNIQUE is to realize a unified portal for a number of different quantum computers. And they are accessible via the cloud for users in Germany and Europe. There are different types of quantum computers. We can divide them into analog and digital systems. In the analog quantum computers, the qubits are manipulated as an ensemble as a whole. Now quantum simulators, and this is not software, this is also hardware, and quantum uh, annealers are both analog quantum computers. On the other hand, so one can ask, what is an example? I can give you an example. An example of the quantum simulator is the uh, Pascal machine, which has uh, been referred to. And an example of a quantum annealer is the D-wave quantum annealer, which also has been uh, referred to. Then we have the digital quantum uh, computers. Now, in these machines, the qubits are manipulated or controlled individually by what is called quantum gates. And examples of this type of machines are the bigger machines of IBM, Google, we have the machines of IQM, which are all based on the superconducting qubits. But we also have, for example, the digital quantum computer of AQT, which is a quantum computer that is based on ions, trapped ions. Currently, in Unique, we provide access to a D-Wave uh, Advantage system, so a quantum annealer with more than 5,000 qubits and to two quantum emulators, so software to simulate uh, quantum computing devices. One of them is the Ulysses Universal Quantum Computer Simulator, and the other one is the Atos Quantum Learning Machine. Soon we will provide access to the quantum computer, which has been developed in the quantum flagship project Open Supercube. It's another quantum computer which is based on superconducting qubits. Then quantum computers which are developed in national German programs will also follow. Providing access to machines is not sufficient. This we also know from high performance computing. Therefore, in UNIQUE, also um, provision is given to services in the area of quantum computing and those resemble the ones of the for supercomputers of the Ulich Supercomputing uh, Center, and this under the direction of experts, experts in HPC and experts in quantum computing. We therefore also develop algorithms and potential use cases. Although it's a topic of research, at the Ulich Supercomputing Center, we have uh, developed in co-design the model of supercomputing architecture, and this is a technology which will be a crucial step to enable this hybrid computing using both the classical supercomputers and the quantum computers. Now, as such, we can say that Unique has taken the first step in uh, the direction of deeply integrating quantum computers in an HPC environment. And in this case, the HPC environment of the Ulich Supercomputing Center. And this to finally come to this hybrid quantum classical computing. 
For this purpose, we also have constructed a special building. These quantum computers are a little bit sensitive. They don't like vibrations, and they also uh, like to have a sophisticated temperature and safety uh, control system. They also like for the uh, integration, the deep integration, of course, they also like to be in the close neighborhood of the supercomputing building of uh, the supercomputing center. Now, with UNIQUE, we also have taken up the coordination of this new Euro-HBC joint undertaking project, HBC-QS. And this started the 1st of December of last year. And since then, this HBC quantum computing integration has been gaining momentum. What is the aim of HBC-QS? The overall goal of the project is to prepare European research, industry and society for the use and federal operation of quantum computers and simulators. In particular, this project aims at developing, deploying and coordinating at European level a European federated infrastructure integrating a quantum simulator of more than 100 qubits in the HPC system of the supercomputer centers uh, in Jullich and also the ones of uh, Jean C CA in France. This federated infrastructure will be accessible via the cloud to public and private European users and this on a non-commercial basis. How will we realize this infrastructure? So the first practical usable quantum computing systems which are based on European developments are these quantum simulators. And actually, as I mentioned before, a quantum simulator does not require the complete control of the individual qubits. And therefore, it's a little bit simpler uh, to build such a system. Therefore, we start with a quantum simulator. In HPCQS, we are now in a public procurement for innovation process for two quantum simulators. One goes to France, one goes to Germany. And they will be implemented as a federated system. Actually, these sites act as tier zero systems in Europe and they serve the users through press. And they are also hosting candidates for the European exascale machines to come from 2023 onwards. Two pre-exascale Euro HPC sites, Barcelona Supercomputing Centers in Spain and Sinica in Italy, are also closely federated with the Juli Supercomputing Center and the supercomputing center at uh, Jean CCA through the Phoenix data infrastructure, which will be extended to include the HPCQS systems. We would also like to mention that this federation is already a first step towards a pan-European quantum HPC infrastructure integrating these tier zero systems with various quantum hardware technologies. How do we meet the challenge to integrate these two technologies? Now, this is based on two major technological developments within the project, and they are supported by a consequent co-design approach via the use cases. Now, there is one technical component, an important one, and that's a production-ready programming environment and middleware for federated quantum simulators. This is based on the quantum learning machine by ATOS. It provides a programming environment on the one hand and a system for direct access to quantum computing backends like the quantum simulator on the other hand. Now, with this ATOS quantum learning machine, the users 
can develop the quantum part of their code. And then they can test access and run the quantum simulator through cloud access. This programming environment is completed by technical libraries and also various types of uh, compilers. As mentioned, in addition, in co-design, we develop uh, use cases. Now, there is a second essential technical component to integrate a quantum simulator in these high-end HPC systems. And to this end, the interconnection between the classical HPC supercomputer and the quantum simulator has to be developed. For this, the project will employ the concept of the modular supercomputing architecture for the integration to enable the lowest latency integration of the quantum simulator. It, this modular supercomputing architecture has been developed in a series of European funded deep projects and it's based on Partex Parastation Modulo, modulo Middleware Suite. What are uh, use cases that we are uh, concentrating on? We have uh, optimization uh, use cases. We have use cases which are based on these uh, variational algorithms. And if we have use cases, we also have our users. What we also have to do is provide our users with training material, user guides, and also courses. What will be the outcome and the achievement of this project? This project will create technology to give European science and industry access to quantum computing in a fully transparent way. It will give this cloud access to state-of-the-art coupled supercomputers with a twin of quantum simulators operated according to the modular supercomputing architecture approach. It will provide a hardware agnostic programming environment, which is the Atos QLM, optimized middleware from Partec, and application libraries, and it will support the end users with co-design training and expert services. This project or this infrastructure is also from the start on designed to be open to new quantum hardware architectures and to new European sites. So this makes HPCQS an unprecedentedly sovereign European offering in terms of the HPC quantum uh, coupling. Architecture supported number of sites, diversity of users and uses and integrated services offered. What is the importance of this project? HPC has become a decisive key technology in a digital world. All leading industrial nations are massively expanding their presence in the development and considered use of this technology as strategic as they regard self-determination and security of state-of-the-art data processing being central issues for the prosperity of their science, economy, and society. Now, if we integrate such a quantum simulator into HPC infrastructure, then HPCQS will create an IT technology in which Europe will be ahead of the rest of the world. Here, Europe can really be the first in the field of computer science, which nowadays is considered to be the owner by the USA or Japan and even meanwhile China. So this project opens the opportunity that the innovative integration technology that is being developed will both generate intellectual property in Europe and lay the foundation for a hardware software industry in this field. What is more, it generally accepted that quantum computing bears highest systemic relevance for Europe. 
in an era where self-determination and security of state-of-the-art data processing have become central issues for European science, economy, and society. Is there also a benefit for EU citizens? Yes, there is. So we do not only target research communities, but also the large and small and medium-sized businesses. And they have to leverage high-end computing to solve practical problems. Which industries are we talking about? Almost all industries can benefit from high-end computing services. So there is a strongly growing demand from the automotive, aerospace, healthcare, chemical and manufacturing industry, as well as from the scientific area. And users use these resources either to solve their own problems or they use it to offer a new or improved service to their uh, clients. As I mentioned, HBCQS is an open and evolutionary infrastructure that aims at expanding in the future by including a diversity of quantum computing platforms at different technology readiness levels and by allowing the integration of other European quantum nodes. So HBCQS is together with UNIQUE the seat for what is called the European Quantum Computing and Simulation Infrastructure, in short, EuroQCS. And this is an infrastructure which has been described in the strategic research agenda of the quantum flagship. So I would like to conclude with this. HPCQS is the first step towards this EuroQCS infrastructure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Crystal, for this very interesting talk. And definitely, HPCQS is one of the projects that the uh, UHPC really has very high expectations and we're keeping an eye to see the, the first outcomes uh, of, of, the, of the project results. Um, so now we will be moving to the panel discussion. So we have one loss, as we can see, and Gabriela had to leave. But uh, instead, uh, from Tzineka, we have uh, Dr. Daniele Cesarini, who is a HPC specialist, who will help us in the discussion. So I have prepared a couple of questions to, to kick off the discussion, and then uh, we can switch to the audience to take some questions from the audience. So I would like to start, first of all, with a uh, subject of exascale, and a rather trivial question, I would say. I mean, exascale is, is coming, is right around the corner. Uh, and I, I, uh, the question would be, how ready are the supercomputing centers for the, the next challenges? What are the challenges uh, moving from the pre-exascale to exascale? And uh, how well prepared your data centers are? And in general, how you see the Europe to be prepared for uh, the exascale systems that are coming. Um, so uh, maybe uh, Frederick, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, the data center, in essence, you need to drop put some more power cables into there and it should be doable. Uh, problem there is you're gonna be using 30 megawatts and then it's a question of is that a same amount of compute you're getting for the, the, the power investment you have to do in it. Is it efficient enough? We're, we're massively scaling up the compute performance available in Europe right now. Getting an exaflop right now might not be sensible. We might not actually have the users. We need to find the users as well. We need to scale up the science we're doing to that. So could we host one? Yes. Would we want to host one right now? That's a different question. Uh, thank you, Frederick Daniele. 
Okay, but your question, I think that one of the main challenges is the power of the data center. So all of three uh, supercomputing center, we need to realize new data center. We was not able to, to reuse the, the old one because the, the main problem is the capability of the system on, uh, on, the, on the power consumption. Mm -hmm. So uh, all of three system will be around, uh, will be consumed around 10 megawatt, which is uh, quite big in, in compare with the, with the last generation and the generation before. I think that uh, this, it will be the main, the main challenge. Consequently, we also have the other main challenge uh, is the cooling system. Cool down 10 megawatt machine is not an easy job. We, and, uh, but it's not an easy job to cool down uh, in an efficient way. So the, I think that the challenge uh, are this bot. We also open a parenthesis also to the programming model GPU base uh, that uh, if you wanna uh, scale up your application on uh, such big machine, you have to handle with uh, multiple <coughs> GPU, multiple memory model, communication. So the, the real cha the challenge are, are a lot, but uh, I mean, the main one are the power and uh, the efficiency of the system that is capable. Right. So we will come back to the application subject a bit later, but let's stick. I mean, Sergi, you agree also power, cooling are the... No. No. We are ready to go. So we have demonstrated. So three years ago, none of us has the capacity to, have to host the systems. We set the limit and we built the limit. And so we are working on it. So you, you want to go exascale? Which technology you mentioned? Because we are including quantum, then it's easier to get there. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, sorry. So we are ready to go. So those are challenges, but are we ready as society, as we're ready to, to devote that much money for this, this is science? Are we ready to, to, to handle all this data that we are generating? So I, I perceive that we have to spend a lot of money on applications because having a system installed, I'm fine. I can handle. Do you want me to increase? I can do. But do you want to make sure that I'm using properly the systems? We have to prepare applications. We have to prepare the software environment. We have to work out. But we set this procedure. So we, that's the reason we're having pre scale, we're having exascale, scale, we're having post scale. So we are on the way. So we're ready. Let's go. Okay. Good. Thank you, Sergi, for the positive note. Christel, I know it's not entirely your subject, but I guess you can give us some the input of, uh, of Julik on this matter? Uh, yes, as I mentioned before, we are ready. Uh, Julik Supercomputing Center is one of the candidates to host the first exascale system. Um, why are we ready? We already have now a pilot system. Our model of supercomputer, Jules, is a good pilot system for the exascale, so we have experience. Do we need another data center? Yes, of course, we need another building to host uh, such a machine with uh, challenges in, in, in cooling and, and power, but we are ready, yes. Okay, great. Then I will move then to the integration of quantum and traditional supercomputers. You can keep the microphone. Then I, I can ask you, uh, what are the, the, the challenges, the physical requirements for co-locating quantum computers with traditional supercomputers? What are the challenges? And also, does it, is it necessary to start immediately integrating with exascale systems, wait for exascale, or we can start uh, with smaller and then scale up from mid-range systems and then do the integration of quantum with exascale? So what is your input on this, Crystal? Um, if you look from the side of the uh, technology, then I often make uh, the comparison. Um, a quantum computer is maybe the child's bicycle, and if we then look at the exascale system, yeah, then we are talking about Ferraris. And of course, they are entirely different and they are entirely different in operation. But um, I would say, yes, it makes uh, a lot of sense to combine exascale with sh such an, uh, a small uh, technology which is still in, in its infancy. And the reason why is um, it's about applications. So we need communities. And in order to develop applications for this quantum computing and this hybrid classical uh, quantum computing, we need the HPC uh, community. 
And um, in Europe, we have a lot of expertise there, but I would say this is concentrated in the big supercomputing centers in Europe. And therefore, it makes sense to connect them to the bigger machines. And how, how we connect them exactly? What, what are the challenges there? Um, how we connect them, as I already mentioned, uh, for the HPC QS um, project, we will connect them by software. The quantum computer will be an extra module in a modular supercomputer architecture. So they will be connected via software. Thank you. Sergi, your opinion on this? I cannot agree more. It's easy. So in Spain, we have just started a, a, a quantum Spain project. We are just starting the procurement of a new system. It will be installed in our facilities. But the concept is not only installing the system. It's just an, a matter of installation. So it needs a, a dark environment, no noise, no vibration. OK, we can handle it. Some cooling, a bit more than colder than, than Cayane. But we can manage this. But applications, applications, applications. So half of the investment of the Quantum Spain project is devoted to merging all the capacities in, in Spain of the different groups that are working on different domains to make sure that when we're having the systems that we, we are just procuring, we are able to test these algorithms on. So it's path is going, so we are ready to go. Daniela? I think that uh, one of the main challenges for the integration will be for sure on the interconnect, but uh, the ecosystem is to do it. I mean, we have to develop uh, API, we have to develop, uh, in particular, workflow. Just want to say that, uh, in particular, the Center of Excellence are, work, uh, are working hard on the workflow, mm -hmm. even in other uh, research uh, project uh, in, in Europe, like UPEX uh, and this kind. We are mainly working a lot on the workflow of the application to leverage on the modularity to leverage uh, on uh, different component. Quantum will be one of them, but uh, is to do it. We have to grow up a community around uh, the quantum. It's, we are going, of course, uh, but uh, the path is, is long. We have uh, to think uh, how to integrate uh, in a standard workflow of the application it's not easy to do manage the today with the workflow on complex application. And so I think that uh, we have to do it. There is a lot of work to do it, but uh, the path is clear. And uh, even the center of excellence, uh, the community are strongly working in this direction. And uh, I see in different research, uh, European research pro project. Okay, thank you, Daniela. Frederick from CAC. So we're looking more at a distributed approach with quantum computers. So the ones we're currently experimenting with are not co-located in the data center. I don't think the physical connection there is the problem. It's more on the software side. But they're integrating them into exascale machines. No, you might not need to. But as mentioned previously, there is a large community attached to these machines, which will then give you potential users which will then give you the applications you want to run on them. Okay. So I, 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 I see that, first of all, there are positive answers coming, positive vibes. People are, are ready to go. And I see, in the end, the question always turns up to applications. This is, this is the key point. So this is my next question. What is the impact on applications, the exascale systems? How ready are applications are? I mean, from your experience as uh, supercomputing centers hosting, providing access to a large number of publications, hosting uh, research groups in your supercomputing center. Uh, how do you see their, their readiness? And also, from the point of view of, of, of EURHPC, uh, the European funding, and having in mind that the, 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 the path to exascale started from 2018 and even earlier from the Commission with, uh, with uh, su support for the uh, centers of excellence. That's, they were mandated to start moving to, to the exascale. How, how far have, have we gone there and what's more is needed, both from the point of view of science and applications, but also from the point of view of policy and funding? 
Sergey, you would you like to, to start on this because we see you. Yeah, Mangalis. So, so the situation is following. Uh, why we are choosing in Barcelona to go for a general purpose system instead of a fully accelerated one? Because number of applications are not prepared. So yesterday, Herbert Seisel on the presentation indicate what we value is energy to solution, not time to solution. So what we wanted to have is the last capacity, all the capacity of the system is used. So we have to set these objectives for every application, how much energy they can use for, that we can afford. Because this is the, the presentation. So it's too expensive, the energy? Okay, no. It really depends on how much you use for the, the solution. So for me, this is the goal. We, ha we have to find out and we need to determine that we wanted to have solution by energy. Mm -hmm. So we need to fix that and that will be a good objective because then you can quantify whether you are applying properly the solutions. Daniel, please. Just let me say welcome in the GP world. Today we have multiple technology at GPU level. It's quite different from just a couple of years ago. Today the main, as in my experience, in my experience in the Center of Excellence, in my experience in the research, in other European research projects related, related to the technology, one of the blocking factor on the technology is the programming model, the language, so everything that uh, is uh, gets stuck the application to run on heterogeneous uh, architecture. So we come from the last 10 years, 15 years, from just one vendor technology. It's, we are a little bit got stuck in this situation. One of the mm, biggest work that the Center of Excellence uh, we will do it is to port application using programming model, using memory model uh, generic, so that uh, they are able to run on different architecture. At the moment, it's not like this. This is a problem that we have to work on. And uh, so I think that this will be one of the main challenges in the next round of Center of Excellence. And also is one of the challenges to use uh, different uh, architecture. We know that in Europe, in Europe we will use different uh, architecture, all right. of three vendor, all of three supercomputing center. At the moment we use two different, uh, two different architecture. We will see at BSC, but uh, it's like this in other different uh, part of the world, United States like. And so the challenge is to work on the application, work on the programming model, on the memory model, which is completely different from the past generation. Yeah, so the portability is a big challenge. We're getting now a bunch of architectures and if the EPI project is successful, we'll get even more. So it's good that we address that now already. Uh, then how ready applications in general are depends a bit on what you actually want to do. We have applications that they, they can fill the machine. Is it one big job? Probably not, but they need the compute power. You also have a few applications that probably need the whole machine, but that's a hard task to solve. Thank you. Christy, do you want to add something? Yes. Um, as we all know, there are applications that will scale. There are applications that does not scale so well. So we have to focus on the ones that scale. And um, we see there are already applications in earth system science, uh, climate uh, modeling also in energy, um, even in simulating quantum computers. So these are applications where we see that uh, scale. And in Jülich, we have the approach, if exascale comes, we can um, take these communities and look for early access to a prototype machine. And for this, we can use our modular supercomputing architecture, take these communities with us and see how, in how far they can, they can scale. And then there are two different uh, types of applications. We have the ones with big data and we have the ones that uh, want to compute. So also with this, uh, we have to take into account how the architecture in the end will look like. 
And it's not because we have an exascale system that everybody has to reach this exascale. This machine should also be used by those who cannot reach exascale. So, and there you have an advantage if you have a modular supercomputing architecture because you can simply use a few modules and maybe you don't need the other ones. Depends on your application. Okay, thank you. Dan, if we move to the quantum use cases, what, what, what do you think are the, the relevant use cases when we combine quantum with HPC when we're moving to HPC? Um, as I said, there are these, uh, for now, in quantum computing, these uh, variational algorithms, hybrid algorithms, that's optimization and the variational quantum eigensolver to calculate minimum energies of uh, molecules, for example. So that's one of these typical um, applications for a hybrid system. But I would say we should not stop there. Um, if we have the HPC community, we have to ask these users, please take a careful look into your workflow and maybe there is a part, even it might be a small part, that does, for example, optimization. Take it out and give it to this quantum module. Maybe we do not have a speed up. I would say at the beginning, so what? Then we have a proof of concept. And, as I mentioned before, maybe we have an energy benefit. So it's not always about speed up. We need an advantage. And maybe the advantage is then in energy consumption. So I would ask the whole HPC community, please take a look, a detailed look into your codes and see whether there is something, even a very small part, that you can give to a quantum module. And then we have interesting applications. Excellent. Yes. It's good idea. Invitation. Uh, Sergi, you want to, to add? No, on, on this. So we have yesterday a presentation indicating the new calls and the, and the new algorithms. It's a, a place to go. Because some applications don't scale. Maybe we can find different algorithms or, or different methods that they scale up, or you can use AI, or you can use a different methodology to solve the problem. Quantum is one, and you can have several. So we should be facing all this, and we analyze that. Okay. okay. From a point of view, the way is the acceleration. So we should initially consider quantum, quantum computing. QPU uh, has an accelerator for standard processing. As uh, they say, it is very important to look in the, in the application, to identify kernel, to identify workflow that uh, we can map on this uh, new modular um, system. And uh, so, but uh, I think that uh, the smooth way will be through um, an integration has uh, how it happens when the GPU come in the HPC field. What, what happens, we start to close to each other with standard system, which are, which are based on only CPU, a big CPU partition. And we, I think that the road is a similar kind of integration. So unfortunately, quantum co computing is not my field of expertise, so I don't really have much to add after these people. Okay. But I, I, I get the message is that it's an invitation to users, please come, experiment. There is potential ahead and take advantage of the new capabilities. Okay, there is one last question, but I will keep it for later, probably. Just uh, I wanted now to open uh, the floor for questions. I don't see anything because of the lights and it's everything dark. So can we have the microphones to the gentleman here, please? It's okay, it's, it's better now. Thank you, oh, oh, thank you. I'm Addison Snell with Intersect 360 Research. Um, I, I appreciated the conversation about applications I'm surprised I didn't hear more about system software in terms of the challenge in moving from pre-exascale systems up to exascale systems. We heard about 
facilities, we need more power and cooling. Okay, fine. Uh, but then I, well, it's easy. We just need to do that. Can you talk about the system software challenges in building out to exascale regardless of quantum? Thank you. Moving back to the start. Thank you for the question. When you're referring to system software, you refer to operating system, managing queues, monitoring systems. What's the concept? Because the, the, the path to access scale is integration of additional technology. That's okay. Multiplying by five the number of nodes we are having on the systems. That's doable. That's possible. Uh, the, the, the problem for me is not on the, on, the, on the system software. So again, we've been fixing this problem so far for, for the last decade, adding, adding new nodes to the systems. So we are exposed to this and, and we can manage. So for, for me, for instance, for system software is the integration of the new technologies because you, you need to handle and to identify how you are probably synchronizing the different capacities. Let me add that uh, I think is that is uh, everything to do with it. So we are at the initial in integration from quantum and the, and the, and the standard application but uh, we have to build uh, everything from scratch. I think that this is a good opportunity to increase uh, the uh, quantum supremacy in Europe to realize center of excellence focusing on this, but uh, we are at the initial stage from software perspective point of view. So it's, uh, we have to develop uh, monitoring system, we have to develop uh, standard API, we have to develop a communication system. So it's a really um, open problem that we should um, start to tackle from different angles and from different point of view. But uh, I personally think that this is an opportunity. It's a big opportunity for all the community, all RSPC, all the community in Europe. So for the HPC systems, when we procure those, we get the system software usually from the vendor. So in that sense, it's not particularly our problem, but it's been challenging. I think every deployment has had its fair share of challenges with that. And if you tr start to integrate quantum into that, well, that's an interesting problem that we need to solve right now. It's working on it partially already by trying to get some form of quantum computers into a HPC system and it's Still early days to see where that's going. I would say going to Exascale, I don't see there uh, a problem in, in, in the system software, so this we can manage. Um, as mentioned by my colleagues, uh, integrating these new compute technologies, that's something different, so therefore we have to build an, a full software stack and, and this will have new ingredients that's, yeah, otherwise not possible with the new technology. This is what one can expect. But I would see this apart from going to the exascale. So there I don't see uh, the biggest challenge. So the biggest challenge is in integrating new uh, compute technologies. And there quantum computing is one example. Maybe in the future, we, in the near future, we have also neuromorphic computing or something else. Thank you very much. I would be interested in uh, understanding uh, what kind of uh, quantum uh, modules you are integrating. Uh, my understanding for uh, Julik is that you have uh, D-Wave currently uh, as you know, uh, quantum annealing, but uh, there are other technologies and uh, the question is what uh, and when do we expect uh, European technologies to be integrated rather than uh, those uh, from uh, US vendors? And as we learned this morning, uh, we heard that uh, verifying the results of uh, the quantum modules is quite a challenge. So maybe uh, Exascale can help uh, to verify that the modules are doing what, you, what they should be doing and uh, how to overcome these critical uh, questions. Uh, yes, so these are several, or these are different questions. So the first question, yes, we have the D-Wave quantum annealer, 
but we do not only have the D-Wave quantum annealer. So the other system that we are integrating is the uh, superconducting quantum computer, uh, which is resulting from the quantum flagship project Open SuperCube. Um, next year, we will integrate the quantum simulator in the HPC QS project. This is also European uh, technology. And in Unique, we are looking at other um, technologies, uh, trapped ions, uh, for example, maybe uh, photonic systems. So we are looking for the whole uh, platform and in the first place we look into European technology. But we should not exclude technology that is much more advanced. And with the quantum annealer, for example, that's the case. There is only one big commercial quantum annealer and that's the one of D-Wave systems. And then one has to see how one deals with it. So we host this system. This means everything, access and so on, is all according to German, so European legislation. That's one thing. Then, um, what was your other questions? I Verifying ah, the, the verification results. of the results, yeah. There, um, HPC plays an important role in benchmarking. So because we can use the systems to uh, emulate what the quantum computer should do. An ideal one, uh, operating at zero temperature, no noise, and so on. So this is our reference system. We can even simulate systems which are non-ideal, so which make some errors. We can make detailed models of what the uh, manufacturers have produced and see what it does. And usually we see this quantum computer makes error. So the point is, can we understand where these errors are occurring? Maybe we can do something about it in the design. So that's one thing where HPC systems play an important role. That's in understanding how these quantum computing devices operate. And then also in benchmarking, because we can take our HPC system playing the role of a quantum processing unit. That is what we do in Unique. So we take our dual supercomputer and let it play the role of a quantum processing unit and see how it behaves and then compare it to how a real quantum computing device uh, behaves. So we have there two important roles for our classical HPC systems. And we love to go to exascale because we know every qubit that we take, we have to double the system size because of, of the memory if uh, you look into uh, exact simulation of these quantum computing devices. So yes, very important role. Does anybody want to add anything? Maybe can I say something about the integration with the, with the system and in particular with the data center that uh, we don't build data center for today's system, we build data center for tomorrow's system. This uh, will also be for quantum system. I think that uh, if uh, we have to be open for every possible technology that will be, uh, will be developed in the quantum field. So the... To be smart uh, is to be flexible on all of this kind of technology, to be flexible uh, on uh, to adapt the system and the data center to host uh, different, different system and to play with different, uh, with different technology. In Sineca, we have, uh, currently we have some uh, um, collaboration with the Wave, but we have also some collaboration with the Pascal. We will start a new collaboration with Alpine. So are, we are very open to very different technology. And uh, we, we are thinking the data center. We took the data center to host uh, different technology that uh, should, uh, uh, that a day we will, uh, uh, we can host. I mean, uh, as I said, uh, we don't work for today. We work for tomorrow. Thank you, Daniel. 
Yeah, maybe one more word on, on, on this quantum computing. We have to be careful in the sense a lot of efforts go into the development of quantum computing. But we cannot develop quantum computing computers and then at the end say, oh, now we have these devices, what are we going to do with it? So we have to start now to think about what are we going to do with it. And there is no other way than having these machines and having access to these machines. Because on paper, it's not going to work. We really have to work with it. And therefore, we have to integrate them and provide them to our users. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so we move to another question. Is there anyone else from the audience that would like to raise? Okay, I don't see. Ah, oh, there is one hand over there in the last minutes. Hi, I'm Ramazit Tamani from Janssen. I was wondering, um, in terms, uh, you know, like quantum computing is evolving, there's new technology coming. Do you have any strategy? on trying to predict in advance how you're going to invest in the new coming technology of the future? Thank you. Who would like to give a first try on this one? Can you please rephrase, elaborate a bit the question because it's not very clear. So wait. So, so well, as I said, there's different technology today and, you know, like uh, there's other coming on the way that are maturing. So you have a plan today for, let's say, a couple of years ahead. But do you have like, let's say there's a drop of technology coming in one year or two. Do you have a strategy how you're going to leverage new technology and integrate it with what you're planning? Because basically you cannot plan on the long term. However, you need to account for the unknown. Um, yes, so a general answer there would be if we have this um, modular supercomputer architecture, we are open for new modules and these new modules uh, can be any new compute uh, technology. So in that sense, we are prepared. If you want to limit to uh, this question to quantum computing, I don't see uh, any problem there. Uh, we integrate already now uh, various types of uh, quantum computers. So if there comes a new platform, um, semiconductor technology, for example, I would say then, um, then we also integrate that one. Actually, I think, yeah, this is a spoiler question for also for my question about the post scale where we are heading, what you see the challenges, and how you see that we should, which direction we should be moving in terms of technologies, in terms of infrastructure. So you have the microphone, give it the first try. <laughs> give it the first try. O already you touched it a bit. Uh, you, you had the slide from, from John about you know, the upcoming. So the, the, the plans for, for, for Portex Exascale you, you need to define what is your plan, what is your target, your objective. So we, we have decided that we want to have own technology. How you build own technology? You have to decide to go for this technology. So you know, at Barcelona, we have said, okay, we're willing to go in different directions. One major one is risk-based systems for general purpose and accelerators on different time scales. So, Maybe this is not the correct one, but this is the way to go, we believe. On quantum, we have decided to start the procurement on a given technology and develop the necessary resources for the applications. This will enable us to have this capacity to integrate all these technologies together in seven, eight years' time. But you have to start moving now. You have to start investments and start working on, on building up the team all over Europe to guarantee that we can make it happen. So what are the challenges today, time, schedule? We have to start now. If we wait for five years, we will buy again. 
If we are buying an scale system, it will be non-European now because we don't have the technology. So we have to be prepared. Um, Frederick, maybe you'd like to add from CSC point of view. So for future systems, I think we need to look a lot at where we get the most impact for the least impact. So the most throughput without spending too much resources on it, where we can get efficient computing, but also not necessarily jumping from one paradigm to another paradigm, because that's always hard for the users. Yes, introduce new things, but keep some form of, uh, keep the old stuff around as well. So hence what I was hinting at, that you'd have multiple strong partitions where you could have one which is, which is indigenous technology in Europe and one that is technology people are used to and then develop from there and see where it's going. I think that the answer will come from the application. So the, techno the quantum technology that we will be able to um, show the, um, an effective um, on uh, application results, application performance, this will be one of the main technology that uh, we probably a supercomputing center will target. But I think that a different quantum technology we will solve different problems, so the point is stay open. Of course, one important thing for the future will, it's not only for the future, we are only already taking it into account, but we have to look for green computing because we cannot go on using more and more energy. So power consumption somehow has to be reduced. And I think this will be relatively easy to take into account in our infrastructures for the future, so. Thank you. Please, one, one more question. Uh, one, oh, uh, one more question, yeah. So for Sadio, primarily, uh, so yeah, sorry. But <laughs> now, since you were uh, talking here about using uh, European technology for the next thing, let's talk about the post exascale machines here. Uh, and you are working very hard and contributing to the European uh, Processor Initiative and, and are, are working on this technology. But if you look on the timeline here, because it's not only proce a processor doesn't make an exascale machine. There is a lot of other technology. You need the networking, you need the, the memory systems and so on. And if you put that additional things and think that we could contribute that with European technology, how does your timeline look then? Can I give the microphone to a different person? <laughs> no, he said no. So, so you need to start. You need to start from the from a relevant and conditional part. So, when you when the UHPC bought the the new machines. They didn't have any chance to choose the processor, nor the network technology, nor the memory, nor the disks, nor anything. Okay? Because it was the vendors who were deciding which technologies they include there inside. So let's start from the accelerator. Let's start to create an, an, an open solution for processors and accelerators. Then, of course, you can then go further and go and integrate new other technologies like memories, like disks. But what is the more relevant? For me, at the end, what you're building is what you're executing. It's based on the processors, whatever it's quantum, whatever it's uh, digital. That's the reason we are pushing for this direction. And I'm not working. People at BSC is doing so. Thank you for the question. Any more answers on this from the panel? No, I think people are content with this. So it's right four o'clock. I would suggest to wrap it up here and give you 
access to the coffee break. So uh, thank you all for joining us this uh, afternoon. Uh, thank very much to the panelists, to the speakers for their presentations and um, will be available for further chit chat during coffee breaks, I guess. So thank you very much. Thank you.